Hello, uh, thank you for joining us at Dragos today, uh, where we will be covering the crash override report, which we released on June 12th, uh, and, uh, this last Monday. Uh, we had uh, previously recorded this uh, session, or I'm sorry, we had previously posted this to the public and failed to record that session. This is a replay of that, uh, where we will be going through the exact same contents. Uh, I am Ben Miller, I'm Director of the Threat Operations Center, and with me today, is uh, Dan Gunter, also of the Operations Center, and uh, Joe Slowick from the uh, intelligence team here at Dragos. Uh, Joe and Dan were primarily the ones who were uh, focused uh, on doing the analysis of crash override. And, and so today, what we'll be focused on is uh, to give some context and background to, to crash override and the events around it, as well as do a bit of a deep dive ex exploration of the malware itself and what it's capable uh, capable of, and then uh, uh, thirdly, we'll explore the uh, impacts uh, from a grid perspective, grid operation perspective, and, and what the, the the most likely outcome from such an attack would be, as well as then focus on the mitigation and defense aspects of uh, what can be done to proactively get in front of crash override and even even future threats that may be doing similar behaviors. So with that, uh, why is crash override unique and so interesting and has um, uh, potentially uh, generated a, a lot of uh, news and attention over the last several days? Uh, one, it's really just the, the fourth ever known malware families to have any sort of ICS tailored components to it. Uh, so the, the first being Stuxnet, and, and then we had Havex and Black Energy 2, and now we have Crash Override. So, so the, the, the swimming pool of, of the, the fish that are swimming here is very, very small, uh, which is just a noteworthy aspect of, of Crash Override. Uh, but also we can distill that down into Crash Override being really the second malware family to have not only industrial process capability, but with the intent and the capability to actually disrupt industrial processes, the first of that being uh, Stuxnet. And then finally, uh, the, the, what makes the Crash Override so unique is, is the, the focus, sole focus really on, on creating impact to electric grid operations, which has been something that has never been seen before in the wild. Uh, so this by itself makes it very noteworthy in that the, the protocol stacks uh, that it understands and, and its focus is set entirely on uh, grid operations. Uh, so in our, our both our, our private report that we released out to customers on, uh, on I believe, Sunday night, uh, as well as the uh, public report that was produced out on Monday, uh, distills crash override with capabilities uh, focused on manipulation of industrial control processes. Uh, denial of control, denial of view, uh, and also having a data wiping component to it to hamper investigations. So those are all uh, various capabilities that we'll be uh, doing a deep dive on to better understand it, uh, but also uh, reflecting the fact that crash override has been attributed to a activity group that we call Electrum. Uh, so Electrum uh, so I, I should say crash override is not something that is widely populated out on the internet or, or uh, being used by multiple multiple activity groups. It's really confined uh, to uh, a activity group we call Electrum. Um, we, we we did we do have high confidence that Electrum has uh, some linkages to the, another activity group uh, dubbed Sandworm by by FireEye. Uh, and Sandworm is, is notable in that it was attributed to the Ukraine uh, 2015 power outage uh, that affected uh, three distribution level utilities uh, on December 23rd, 2015. Uh, so we, we can't say uh, with any confidence level that Electrum e e equates to uh, Sandworm. Uh, we can only uh, uh, find uh, correlations that really link the two, and, and then it, it gets a little bit dodgy after that. Uh, but we, we do have high confidence that uh, of the, the linkages between Electrum and, and Sandworm. With that said, uh, uh, to kind of frame things and where we're going, uh, the ICS kill chain was released in August of uh, 2016. 
uh, it was uh, co-authored by our CEO Rob Lee as, as well as uh, Mike Asante, and it explored the the steps needed to really create an impact into an industrial environment and the steps required. And really, it's uh, it's extending a lot of the uh, the kill chain concepts that are, are uh, very typically found in, in in the IT circles and adding the the stage two of industrial control systems and what would be needed to attack that. Uh, and that's exactly what we're focused on today with crash override. Uh, so the crash override is really a payload that would get delivered into the ICS environment with the sole purpose of attack. And that's what we'll be exploring rather than a whole sequence of event events or hypotheticals of how it got there. Uh, we're only going to focus on what we know, which is uh, the, the crash override modules. Uh, but with that, I will uh, take a pause and turn it over to Dan Gunter, who is uh, one of the leads during the investigation, and, and really just overview uh, how everything got kicked off and uh, how how we got to today. Uh, I'll kick it over to you, Dan. Thanks, Ben. So yeah, on the 8th of June, we basically received an early copy of the ESET report to help them validate some of their findings. And so that's when we initially learned of the malware. And at that point, we just had hashes. We weren't actually provided the samples. And so we took the hashes that we were provided and we were able to locate those samples and start analysis. Once we started analysis and validated that it was in fact something, we sent early warning to our customers um, on that Friday. On Saturday, we finished our preliminary analysis. So we only had about 48 hours to do that. And we sent on confidential notification to customers and to some key stakeholders involved. On Sunday, we then notified multiple certs and other organizations all across the globe, so not just here in the US, but everywhere. And we also put out an initial TLP AMBER report to the community to give them basically a heads up before it went public, a chance to respond to that. So the next thing is the power outage itself actually happened on the 17th of December, just before midnight. And the substation de-energized, resulting in an outage for the service area. Something we want to note is why this particular effect was quickly remediated was because the utility was able to quickly transfer the substation into manual mode and begin restoring power in 30 minutes. And they had it up in about an hour, hour and 15 and so because of the hard work of the utility, um, this was a very, or a much shorter term impact than what it had to be. With that, I'm going to turn it right back over to Ben. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, I think it's uh, important from, from a timeline perspective as well. So, so Dragos was kind of a bit under the clock, and, and there was uh, some discussions on, on uh, what should or should have been released publicly. And we were really just, uh, meeting the, the uh, ESET's uh, deliverables and, and, and uh, what they were going to release. So we were lining up against that, that timeline. Um, I will now uh, kick it over to, uh, excuse me, uh, Joe Slowick uh, to go over the uh, initial portion and framework of, of Crash Override. Thanks, Ben. So the interesting part about crash override and the circumstances in general is that unlike the 2015 incident where you had to have a operator on keyboard moving a mouse away uh, somewhere else in the world in order to cause an effect, the cause of the impact in 2016 was the malware itself. So the malware is able to interact with the RTUs directly with only having a configuration file provided to it and not having a human in the loop to you know, move the mouse and do something on the other end. In our investigation, we found this malware to be quite modular, so with multiple uh, parts and pieces put together in order to achieve the effect, principally a payload DLL specifically designed to create the intended industrial control system effect, paired with a wiper module that was included to inhibit or completely delay or make impossible any recovery of the ICS system and therefore the power grid. Now, if you look at crash override as an overall framework, you have the main back door op occupying the central top stage there, and that can put into the network various other pieces of equipment. So there are some additional backdoors that ESET mentioned in their report that we did not have any access to, but uh, they indicated were present, as well as additional tools such as a port scanner that the adversaries in question could use to tie into that backdoor. 
but primarily the crash override framework consists of this backdoor installing a launcher, which is then used to fire off either a <clears throat> one of four distinct ICS focused payload modules and then executing the data wiper thereafter. For the initial intrusion, we have no knowledge of how the network was initially breached. Uh, we do know how the ICS effect was later achieved. So the implant itself, the backdoor that was put on the network, has a proxy-specific beaconing backdoor. When I say proxy-specific, the implant was hard-coded with the address of the internal proxy server to speak directly to that in order to route traffic out to the wider internet to reach the command and control servers. Therefore, a lot of this had to be staged beforehand and a lot of information had to be available to the actors in question in order to design their malware in such a way that it already knew how the network was set up. What does this imply? It implies a prior foothold and some level of you know, fairly extensive reconnaissance in order to map out the network and how communications could pass in and out of the ICS space. Furthermore, the timestamps of the malware we recovered tell a story. So if you look in the lower right corner, you'll see in the black and white screen, these are the metadata that is shown just in looking at the backdoor module that you, know, you have a timestamp that's basically eliminated. You know, the timestamp is meaningless, January 1st of 1970. Someone decided to get rid of it. But by digging into the file a little bit deeper, we were able to recover actual timestamps of compilation. And that shows a much more interesting answer of December 18th at 2.48 in the morning, 2016. Now, the timestamp here will be an artifact of the machine on which it was compiled upon. But uh, as you can tell earlier, with the impact to the Ukrainian power station being on the 17th in the very late hours of the day, uh, presumably this machine is on a different time zone than the local time in the Kiev region that the sample was put together not that far in advance of the actual effect taking place. So there's you know, definitely a strong indicator here that the crash override framework that was used in order to achieve the effect of the Ukrainian institution was put together and placed on target only you know, quite shortly in advance of the effect actually taking place, implying that a different tool or something else was there far longer to enumerate the network and gather the necessary information to set up crash override in order to successfully communicate out of the network. One last bit about those communications. So we already talked about how it's direct communication to some hard-coded proxy addresses. But then if that communication is successful, the malware then attempts to make an HTTP connect to a command and control server. The C2 server is in question, and we were able to identify four within the samples available to us were all associated with Tor nodes. And I emphasize associated because while a review of Tor service records indicates that all four addresses were serving as Tor nodes at the time of the Ukrainian events, no, there is no evidence or we've been able to, unable to retrieve any evidence that Tor is actually used at any stage in the communications to the command and control server. Having said that, the backdoor calls out to the command and control server in order to receive its instructions. This is another important point. So this backdoor doesn't function as a remote access tool where someone will interactively operate with it on keyboard, manipulating it in real time. Instead, it has to reach out through this proxy, hit the command and control node, retrieve instructions. Those get passed back to the, to the backdoor, which executes whatever instructions are passed and lets the command and control server know what the result was. So there's certainly a time lag between beacons for when this implant is allowed to do or take some level of functionality. As far as the instruction set offered on the back door, it's fairly standard for a remote access tool. You know, you have an opportunity to execute a process, launch a service, uh, launch something as a different user by, by supplying credentials. So, you know, fairly standard tool set. But we noticed there was something that appeared to be lacking in reviewing the overall functionality. Namely, we did not identify a purpose-built module for exfiltration or extraction of data from the network. So this implies that the lack of an exfiltration tool, that it's not a general purpose use remote access tool. You couldn't simply drop this in any environment and use it for, say, espionage if you're a nation state, or if this is not a nation state, you know, this is not going to allow you to start stealing banking credentials and other items. So it implies a limited functionality set or more limited than a lot of other standard toolkits, specifically to further a the, the impact in question here, so the ICS. Finally, moving on to persistence, so malware typically likes to figure out a way that it can survive if the machine reboots so that you 
adversary doesn't have to reinfect the box. In the case of crash override for the backdoor module, there's no direct persistence mechanism. When the backdoor is first placed on host, it executes and just runs itself. So there's really no way for it to dig in and survive it should the machine be rebooted. However, one of the commands offered by the command and control server is an option to hollow out or redirect a service running on host. So as long as you're picking a service that's not critical to Windows general functionality, you can have the service name point not to the legitimate binary behind it, but to the illegitimate or malicious executable that is the back door. And a hard-coded value in this sequence then sets that service to start on boot. By executing this command via the command and control server, then the malware will find a way to persist through a system reboot. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ben, and we'll move on to the launcher module. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Joe. I, I think to reiterate the, um, the, the or, or maybe to, to summarize the, the, the backdoor capability, there, there's a lot of this. Uh, there was at least some chatter or, or conversations that we've had with folks saying the, the backdoor is very uninteresting, uh, uh, and, and it kind of is in a lot of ways, but. It, I would say it's very much focused to do exactly what it needed to do and nothing else. Uh, so if there were a key takeaway in, in even just uh, what uh, we've gone through so far, it's that it's very much tailored to, to a, a target network and uh, had the, the core capabilities that it needed in order to do its job and that's it. Uh, but uh, let's uh, keep moving along and I will uh, flip it over to uh, Dan to talk about the uh, launcher module. Dan. Thanks, Ben. And so to achieve the modular functionality within the crash framework, the backdoor has it at its disposal the launcher module. And what this is, is this is the thing that actually controls all of the submodules under it. And how it does this is it uses an exported function called crash in a Windows dynamically linked library. And what this is is a Windows file type where basically you can bundle functions together to provide additional functionality at runtime. And so with this, what they built was DLLs that took in a configuration file. And so when the backdoor is calling the launcher, it's going to use a working directory, it's going to use the name of the DLL, and then it's going to give it a function. And it's going to call that exported crash function. So how the launcher module actually, actually works is it creates a service on the box. And in our sample, it was called defrag service. It would then call the crash caller and wait for that crash caller to exit and then gracefully end. What that crash caller looks like would do this. So again, we were mentioning those command line arguments. And so it would change directory to whatever working directory you gave it in that first argument it would locate that crash function in that Windows dynamically linked library. It would spawn a wiper thread with, action, with an hour long countdown. And then it would call the exported crash function from the actual um, provided DLL. What the wiper thread looks like is this. And so the sample we had, it had a sleep timer set for an hour. And so what this allowed to happen was it enabled the ICS action, the protocol action, that actually happened and before the box actually went down. And so it would sleep for an hour, it would load the wiper, and the wiper in our samples was always called either haslo.dat or haslo.exe. It would locate the exported crash function in that DLL. Again, all of them export a function called crash, hence the name that we've given to this. And then the wiper after the hour would start wiping. So payload modules. The wiper itself is actually one of the payload modules. In addition, the ICS protocols were the other modules. With this, the activity group is able to build different modules for different ICS protocols and ship them out as needed. They ship again as DLLs and they have that common framework functionality through that function that's available. 
In our samples, we're aware of four protocols being targeted. That's IEC 101, which is a serial protocol. There's IEC 104, which is actually the TCP IP implementation of 101. There's IEC 61850, OPCDA. And then, as we mentioned, the wiper module is a module. It's separate from above because it's obviously not a protocol. So this is where you would kind of expect to see each of these given protocols on the network. So as we mentioned, you might see that serial connection on the left side, go into that digital relay panel, and then that RTU. The IEC 104, which is the module that we analyzed, and we should note that the 104 module is the only one that we were able to obtain. It's the only one we got a hash value from, and it's the only one we've found so far. We're definitely interested in studying the other ones. We just haven't been able to obtain them just yet. So for the IEC 104, what this does is it provides communication between the control station and each of the substations. As I said before, it's a TCP IP implementation of IEC 101. And what this means is it works over your general purpose networks. It's not a serial connection where it's a direct, more of a direct line works over the same networks that your computer at home or at work or goes off of. It uses a subset of commands. It uses a master-slave architecture, meaning there's a master device that's able to send and receive from the slave devices, and the slave devices really only talk to the master. We do want to note with this implementation, it is a full implementation of the master architecture. And so they didn't implement really any slave functionality but they do have all the master functionality in there. It's capable of on-demand and spontaneous transmission, remote capability. In this file transfer, it's an IEC 104 file transfer. This is not more of, or this is not exfilling files from the box. It's part of the industrial protocol itself. And I'll note that the sample we examined is the one with this hash value. So execution flow. So how it works is there is that exported crash function again that gets called. The configuration file then gets read. The main thread then starts kind of a child thread that runs, that kills the com service process. And what this communication service process is, is it might be the legitimate master IEC 104 server. What this in effect does is take over as the master um, on this given machine. It'll then create a socket. It'll send data to slave devices and go in a loop of sending and receiving. When this is done, the main thread will wait for threads to finish and finish execution. So the configuration file, it needs a target IP. Um, you can give it multiple targets. You can also give it the communication process, or it'll try to kill the default one. It's also capable of performing a few operations with the registers. So those registers that I talked about are actually what open and close the relays. So what this can lead to is loss of control. If you force all of them to open, you'll have loss of control. The lines will start getting de-energized. And this is obvious badness. And this is the sequence mode. In the range mode, what happens is it interrogates to find out What's the current state? And then it'll toggle the state of those registers between open and close, basically opening and closing things at the substation. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to uh, chime in here and make a, a couple a couple points on the 104 module and, and some of the context that, that we've covered today. Uh, um, I think, uh, one, it's important to note uh, what Dan said regarding the the 104 module being a, a really a complete implementation of the uh, the master capability for the protocol, uh, so that really allows for a, a wide range of functions. It, it's a full implementation. Uh, however, the module itself is is artificially constricted to only a couple use cases uh, that Dan illustrated. Uh, in particular, the sequence mode and, and the range mode are what's available to the attacker who's uh, using the 104 module. However, the, the module itself uh, certainly would be capable for being adapted into other uses and in, in other scenarios. So well, while it, the, the 
crash override uh, module is kind of self-constrained -con based on the configuration file, it definitely has more functionality underneath the hood that could be leveraged. Uh, but also, uh, one of the other points uh, drawing in from what Joe was talking about with the the uh, launcher and, and how the sequence of events unfolds with the launcher, keep in mind that the, the 104 module would be executing uh, while the, the launcher thread is counting down to uh, the uh, zero minute, if you will, to, to execute the wiper module. Uh, so that means that the activity that the 104 payload would be doing would cease to, ex uh, cease to, to happen because of the wiper module basically uh, pricking the box. Uh, but, but to get some more focus on what the wiper module does in, in the specifics there, I will uh, kick it over uh, to Joe to, to uh, enumerate through that functionality. Okay, thanks a lot, Ben. So moving on to the wiper module, you know, the goals here designed to erase some very specific ICS configuration files and Windows files as identified by the file extensions, the part after the got, and also to render the computer non-bootable. Uh, just like the various payload modules, it works in conjunction with the loader module, and the loader module calls the wiper via the exported crash function. So that makes it essentially, you know, API-like, visually is the same <clears throat> compared to the payload modules that cause the ICS effect. Now looking for the flow of the wiper module, we see that the registry, first various registry keys are zeroed out, the image path for those registry keys and specifically for critical system services. What this does is it makes the system unbeatable, unbootable. Then the <clears throat> wiper module proceeds on to the various files that it's targeting, so erasing specific ICS configuration files and then other files by extension, and finally kills processes on the box, thus killing the machine, or as uh, Ben previously said, breaking the box. Now looking at the file extensions, this is where elements get a little bit more interesting. So we notice that the wiper module enumerates system drives C through U, W through Z, so if you're running off of A, B, or V, you're in good shape, otherwise you're in trouble. The wiper module looks in those drives for some very specific items. So a table can be found on the left of this slide. So there's the various items largely associated with the AVV PCM 600 as a point of emphasis. So we see project files, we see template files, we see various other uh, configuration and management activity on there. So the purpose behind doing this would be to make it more difficult to try and restore a system. So if these are not backed up elsewhere or to a different system, they are presumably lost and impeding the, or eliminating the possibility of restoring service as it existed prior to the wiper module executing. With that, I'll pass it over to Ben, who will review some grid scenarios based upon what we've talked so far and how this will, may have actual effect within the power grid environment. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so w we have a, a lot of actually moving parts here, and we also, uh, we focused, on, uh, what we've covered today was the analysis that Dragos has performed, but uh, ESA has done a, a solid uh, 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 analysis on some of the other modules that we don't have. And so from a, a grid operation standpoint, uh, it's really interesting. It's it's important to understand how all these modules can play together to to really do uh, um, some some not nice things. Uh, so certainly uh, loss of control, loss of view uh, in the wiper capability. Um, what's all the modules and how does that relate to this? Uh, so so one of one of the modules that we didn't cover, but uh, ESET did a strong analysis on, was the OPC DA uh, module. So this really is designed to create the, the loss of view, that second bullet. Uh, it, how it does that is it, cre it, it enumerates the, the OPC tags uh, on the server and isolates the, uh, the, the relays, and it changes the values of, uh, of each of those to uh, a hex value 0, 1, and it does that twice. Now, based, based on uh, Drago's uh, analysis, we believe that causes a Oh, it's called a um, value out of limits uh, 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 component, which more or less uh, puts the the uh, the value at a a un, undefined condition, uh, so that when the operator is looking for a status of a that particular that particular relay, it's it's just showing a uh, a non-state. Uh, so the the system operator simply will not have visibility on whether the, the breaker is open or closed, for instance, uh, which 
is bad if you start pairing that with the 104 module that, that Dan outlined that has the uh, sequence state to not only put the uh, open the breaker, uh, uh, which is de-energizing uh, that component, uh, but it also then continues to loop it, uh, uh, continuously by continuing to set the at that breaker to open. So if the operator is unsure uh, based on loss of view or does have view and, and sees that the breaker is open when it shouldn't be, or the, the relay is taking a protective action and says, and, and sends a command over to the, to the breaker to reclose, uh, that while the breaker may or may not receive, receive that command based on the, the, the vast chatting of, of the loop of the 104 module, or maybe it closes, and then immediately it reopens because of the execution of the 104 payload. Uh, so you have that combination of a denial of control along with uh, the manipulation of the 104 to, to keep that, that uh, breaker uh, open. Uh, as well, uh, we have the other component of the 104, the other mode uh, called uh, range. Uh, so the range, if that was set in the configuration file, is really going to uh, cause uh, more of a, 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 a very much the same impact, uh, but in a, a slightly less controlled fashion. So it's going to open the breaker, and then it's going to close the breaker, and then it's going to loop through that sequence over and over again. So now, instead of uh, de-energizing the line, it's really bringing the, the, the line off, uh, on and off uh, uh, from a electricity standpoint. Uh, which would be uh, bad from a, a relay standpoint. So, so typically the relays, which are kind of the, the automated brains uh, 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 and the, the protective measures that are automated in the substation to both the protect equipment as well as maintain stability of the grid, it, that's going to start reacting. However, uh, uh, ESET has access to a module uh, uh, that has the potential to cause impact uh, to relays as well. So, so those brains of the substation could also be hampered uh, by a known exploit uh, uh, that is targeting Siemens C Protec uh, 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 protected relays. Uh, so this this is a, a known uh, vulnerability. Actually, has a CVE. Uh, it's uh, CVE 2015-5374. Uh, so, the, so the potential here, uh, and this is. Uh, unexplored territory, uh, but it, it's very much in the realm of possibility, it is to uh, uh, cause a denial of service against that, that Siemens uh, relay and potentially put it into a, a um, block state. So there, there is some open question of if the, the denial of service condition only affects the communications module of the relay or if it affects the entire relay and, and, and actually prohibits it from doing uh, the uh, protective schemes that it's designed for uh, from the denial of service attack. Uh, so if, if it is a case where it bricks the entire uh, relay uh, and you start combining that with the opening and closing of breakers, then really what you have is the uh, 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 ultimately both a, a reliability as well as a safety condition where uh, the the relays are not protecting the the substation and, and the equipment at the substation as it should, uh, which uh, may uh, end up creating a, a a small islanding event that's a bit broader than than the substation itself. Now, it is important to emphasize that uh, this doesn't mean that in the electric grid is going down or, or, or that damage is going to be caused from this equipment directly, directly from a uh, uh, crash override. However, it's definitely opportunity to cause uh, islanding events and, and de-energizing lines or, or subcomponents of the grid in, in a, a I would say very rudimentary fashion. Uh, so this isn't sophisticated uh, based on the, the functionality and, and what the configuration file for 104 limits it to, uh, but certainly it's novel and it could, uh, uh, similarly to the uh, 2015 power outages that happened across uh, three different utilities in Ukraine, that could be a scenario uh, that a crash override could be used in. 
uh, but not in a way that is causing a, a cascading in instability effect that's going to uh, really have wide-ranging consequences. This, this is a very niche, however extremely notable uh, that even uh, this software uh, exists and has the ability to, to cause these uh, sorts of impacts. Um, I'm making sure, did I miss any of the interesting module plays? I, I don't believe I did. Uh, so I'm going to now uh, turn it back over to, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Joe to focus on detecting this and, and mitigating it in some of the, the real world actions uh, that we can focus on going forward. Joe? Okay, thanks, Ben. So now that we've talked a lot about what crash override is, what it does, now we want to really get to how do we defeat it? How do we find it? How do we stop it? So having said that, crash override is relatively lightweight, consists of different pieces that you know, with in and of themselves have a limited functionality, but there's enough going on here that we've got things to come to grasp with to either create as alerts or as things to guide us in how we defend and protect our network. So monitoring and implementation will ensure that we catch these events more quickly because really, at the end of the day, what we're aiming to, to achieve is minimizing that amount of time between initial breach and when the network is remediated and systems and services are restored. Um, can't assume that we'll always be able to stop every breach, but at least ensuring that the tech time of detection is quicker, more accurate, and allows actionable responses by, on the part of defenders puts us in a much better place than if we were to just find out about this only when the power goes down. So looking at host-based items, there are some specific things that we can key off of. For one, Crash Override makes fairly extensive use of mutex values, both in its own operation and in profiling the system prior to execution. So we noted one particular mutex value, and mutexes are sort of like flags or identifiers that a program can assign to resources to claim them or claim them for related processes. They're also leveraged by malware to do things such as signal if a machine has previously been infected by a variant or the same malware to prevent reinfection or other things. In this case, we saw crash override look for a very specific, well, a pattern of mutexes, so API protection, the spelling of protection, followed by a three character sequence of lowercase letters or numbers. It didn't write this mutex value, but rather it looked to see if it was there. Did not appear that there was a, a switch within the program that if that mutex did not exist, that it would have stopped executing, but it is possible that this is looked as a check to see if this was a machine previously compromised by another toolkit. For example, the one that we're assuming or assessing had to be there in order to allow for the network surveillance and profiling in order to build such a bespoke piece of malware such as the hard-coded proxy address. On a more active note, the malware writes a blank mutex to the system. When I say blank, it's literally a blank mutex. There is no name assigned to it, so you'll just see the mutex exists with no actual identifier. Finding this in logs can be difficult because it may end up as being flagged as ephemera, but it is something to look for in correlation with other items could be significant. Another item that comes down the line is a dropped file named imappy, which is dropped to the user's root folder within the Windows file structure. We're not 100% sure what this is for, but we do see that it gets created and then deleted after <clears throat> file execution complete. Seeing that this is, even exists or that it's created or deleted are all signifiers that a crash override or crash override-like infection event has taken place. So these are interesting and good ways to try and identify what we've seen, but what we really want to do is put defenders and ICS networks in a position where they're catching more general badness. Not the cra crash override infection event that we're aware of, but the one that's going to come down later, maybe next December or somewhere else down the line. So on a more general level, we want to key off of how the adversary in this case operates. What are their tells? What are the things that they like or need to do? The one thing that we observed in multiple cases of the back door is that the back door would take a file name mimicking a legitimate Windows system process. So one good example is svchost.exe. Very important, very legitimate Windows process, but it should be running out of uh, Windows System 32, Windows Syswas 64, not in App Data Local Temp or some other location where the back door will be executing from. So looking for cases where you have common system file names or vital system file names running out of non-system spaces is an excellent way to identify malicious activity as malware tries to blend in with other items in the system. Another tell was the service image path aud auditing. So for the <clears throat> persistence module or the persistence functionality to take effect, they, the malware had to identify a non-critical service and then point 
the registry key for its image path to the malware to enable launch on boot. Much more advanced than the infection chain on the wiper module to render a system non-operable, point the same image path to a null val value. That is not terribly helpful at that point because the system is about to be completely compromised and, and bricked, but the earlier alert by auditing what image path values are pointing to could be very valuable in catching the initial stages of an infection event. By applying measures such as these, not only are you going to catch crash override, but you'll catch the next event as well as many similar events because these aren't you know, super scary, unique, and or esoteric means of operating on system, but rather fundamental ways of operating that enable an adversary to compromise, maintain access to, and manipulate a host. Moving to the network side, we, we certainly have IP addresses. We mentioned four exist and that they were associated with the Tor service. The IP addresses themselves are a historical indicator. They're likely not going to be useful for future use. They've been publicly mentioned in many sources at this point, and more than likely are included in so many threat intelligence lists that they're going to be blocked nearly in all environments. So I'll, my recommendation for these sorts of items is block them, but also monitor, because if you see something trying to communicate to a blocked address that was associated with a major event, such as crash override, the indication to the analyst should be that I have something on a system that is attempting to communicate to a known bad item. Presumably, you would want to know what that is and figure out what's causing this traffic, how did that cause get there, and do I have an infection event on my hands as a result. But just like with host items, we really want to look for more general indicators, more general ways of operating that we can key off of to enable our defenders and to catch not just crash override, but subsequent infection events or attempts. One of the items that stuck out here, and again, Tor as a actual you know, useful service in this, you know, we never saw actual Tor traffic, just that some of the C2 nodes happen to also be serving as Tor nodes. We can use this, though, as a way of taking care of a fairly large sweep of potentially malicious and certainly policy violating, at least in an ICS environment for certain, traffic. So a running list uh, taking into account all existing Tor nodes, which changes over time. So this is something that you can't just drop a list in and walk away, but rather you have to update this, you know, ideally daily, but certainly over you know, some fairly narrow period of time to block communications to all such Tor nodes and monitor for communication attempts to those nodes. Because that should be a very good indicator that some sort of malicious and or not very, certainly not business critical traffic is taking place and trying to figure out what's causing it to happen. Moving into the ICS network itself, looking for things like the excessive protocol management traffic that would happen in the on-off, on-off switching scenario. Certainly you would expect a legitimate controlling device to communicate to an RTU, but to alternate between two states rapidly um, over a period of time would be a signifier of something bad going on. In the structure of the crash override event, we have about an hour between that effect taking place and the wiper module. So You've already progressed into the effects delivery stage of the infection, but you may buy yourself time to identify this and take some sort of remedial action to prevent the wiper from firing. So at least giving the defender more time to take a more reasonable and certainly more beneficial reaction. Lastly, any protocol management traffic coming from systems that aren't supposed to be sending this to RTUs or other you know, physically relevant devices should be an indicator of either a policy violation or something malicious going on. So we don't know exactly where the traffic in crash override was coming from that resulted in the outage, but if a network were sufficiently instrumented, mapped out, and identified, you can narrow down the list of known good or certainly you know, the only host that should be talking to these units, and anytime you see an attempt for traffic coming from elsewhere in the network as an indication that either something's broke, someone's doing something they shouldn't, or you have someone trying to take advantage of some access to the network and some understanding of it, but not complete access and complete understanding by launching this sort of traffic from a non- trusted or non-business critical point. With that, I'll hand it back over to Dan to walk through Yara and how we can leverage this to even to improve our detection methodologies even greater. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so as Joe mentioned, Yara is a really good way of matching patterns. Um, and it works with a variety of pro products and also with sites. What this allows you to do is very robust malware detection. So you can either search by string or you can search by bytes, and we're going to look at two examples specifically developed on our set. As Ben's going to have later in these slides in the resource section, we put all of our signatures up on GitHub so they're accessible there, but we're going to show you two rules and talk through them right now. And so this is an example of a strings-based rule. 
And so what this works in, in is the 104 module. And in that module, as part of the logging functionality, there are some very specific strings. And these strings are only really found in this file, actually. And so it's really good to kind of build the signature off of these and look for these strings either coming in and out of your network on your host or even wider than that. We use some of these samples actually to find the malware out in the wild in some of the repositories. The other example you can do, which is a little more powerful, is not just strings, but also bytes. And so this might look a little crazy at first, but what this is, is in the file parsing that happens for the config file, there's a set of commands that's repeated over and over. And it's a very specific set again. And so this is another example how you can look for a very specific part of the file or functionality. So with this, you can do it on the application level. You can do host scanning and you can log those results. If you're using Bro, the intrusion detection system, you can grab binaries out of traffic and run these YAR rules against it. And the benefit you get, again, is that robust pattern matching to find malicious items. How this is different than just using file names or hashes is that it's easy to regenerate a different file or to change the name of the file and have both the name and hash be different. If you're looking for some of these byte values, you're going to get beyond just the name or the hash level, and you're going to find a lot more sophisticated threats. This also gives you greater visibility on the host and on the wire. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe. Thanks, Dan. So we've talked a little bit about detecting. How about defeating? So what are the things that you can do to prevent these sorts of events from taking place or at least minimize the impact and really empower your defenders to defend the ICS network against the truly malicious and you know, physically damaging threats such as crash override? So while the initial infection route is unknown, it likely originated in the IT network. Now, unless the, I, the ICS network is directly connected to the internet, which is certainly possible, uh, typically you'll have to see an adversary tunnel through known communications pathways from the IT network into the OT network to start having an effect within ICS space. To figure that out, the adversary is going to have to follow the same sorts of paths or the only paths that are available that are used for legitimate system administration other needs. So to move from IT to OT, the adversary needs to understand that now those trust boundaries and take advantage of them. But what defenders need to do and what system architects and other stakeholders need to do is identify what those key nodes are in route from the IT into the OT network and establish appropriate monitoring and defensive measures on those critical path nodes. Since you know that someone has to hit those in order to get into the space where they're going to have the desired effect, those become great points of emphasis in terms of allocation of resources and detection methodology to spot when something malicious starts to happen rather than seeing it only at the effect stage where you're already putting yourself into a position of having to do some significant level of system recovery. Additionally, we emphasize this a lot in talking about both host and network indicators, but moving away from isolated atomic historical data points as much as possible because at the end of the day, all these really do is tell you about the last infection or about other events that were taking place before that information became fairly widespread. Adversaries, but not always, will change their infrastructure and their techniques when they know that that information is public knowledge at that point, especially advanced actors, because they certainly want to make sure that they don't get caught. Therefore, instead of looking at blacklisting domains, IPs, hash values as a defensive measure, instead chain these with the sorts of behavioral, robust, compound <clears throat> analytics that don't look towards what happened but tell you how things are going to happen in the future. So it might be the case that an adversary is going to use a different IP address down the line for their command and control infrastructure, but they still may be doing the same sort of service name patterning that was experienced in Crash Override and have lsass.exe running out of a non-standard location. And by keying off of the behavior analytics, which ties into a fundamental actor activity, you then set yourself up to detect not just crash override the next time it comes around in a slightly different form, but a host of other potential malicious activities as well. Where are we at the moment? Right now, we've 
talked about enabling and monitoring extensive host logging of events for critical systems, really making sure that those key nodes in line between the IT and the OT network, as well as within the OT network itself, because it should never be the case that every device within the ICS network can talk to every other, but rather certain devices should be privileged, others should not, and they should be segmented off by function or purpose or design. Therefore, identifying what those central nodes are and getting between these different functional areas sets up a list of um, key terrain, so to speak, for additional hardening, defensive measures, and monitoring. Identifying what these are, ensuring that they're locked down, so to speak. So one suggestion thrown here is you know, going towards the system uh, service renaming or adopting a system service naming schema to try and hide within the noise, so to speak. Make sure that programs can execute or can execute at a privileged level, except out of these you know, these system locations, and then monitor for alterations to those vital binaries as well. Across an entire network, that might be an onerous task, but on a few select machines that are of vital importance towards maneuvering within the network, this is far more doable and can be a very quick and easy win towards identifying this malicious activity once it takes place. And lastly, this may seem somewhat trivial, but have a plan for when this occurs. We saw in the Ukrainian incident, in, <clears throat> instance that the defenders were able to recover power because rather than being chained to the ICS systems as a way of operating, they switched to manual override or manual recovery of the impacted substation to restore services. So long as there is a backup or the idea of what actions need to be taken should systems fail and having that recovery and <clears throat> remediation plan in place ensures that when a breach occurs in a way that no one had ever thought of before, that at the very least the organization finds itself in a position where it can recover more effectively and restore service to customers more quickly. With that, I'll pass it back over to Ben for some parting thoughts. Oh, great, Joe. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, so a lot of what we covered today is uh, uh, posted in the second link here on Andregos.com, the crash override report, which is the public report that was released on uh, Monday uh, the 12th, is available, uh, as well as the Yara signatures that uh, Dan demonstrated and, and uh, some of the indicators that have been kind of scattered throughout this entire presentation. All of those are cons consolidated on a public uh, GitHub uh, repo, which is available at that first link there. And, and that has had a couple updates to it over time. And as we do more research, we'll be uh, using that as a, the, the central location for, for any sort of updates that we do do. Um, while, uh, while we're, we're wrapping up, just some, some final thoughts uh, on what Crash Override kind of, kind of presents to us today. And, and, and I want to reiterate one of the, the items on the 104 payload specifically uh, and the reliance on the configuration file. Uh, so that, rely, that, that configuration file was created manually. It, it was not an auto-generated thing. Uh, and that really speaks to uh, the current level of uh, uh, attack capability there it is very much an interactive and highly um, highly targeted fashion where where a person is creating the targeting list and then uh, sending that through through the, the uh, command and control to deliver uh, the effects that they're going for. It is not a get it into the environment and, and it just does its own thing. It's not like a worm that just does these sorts of uh, uh, effects uh, uh, that we outlined today. It is very much a activity group, Electrum, uh, uh, that's behind that. Uh, and, and it's important to, to recognize just while this is a indeed a very interesting and powerful capability in order to de-energize uh, lines or, or potentially uh, islanding substations, it is still something that is a high bar uh, and, and is not something that is immediately going to, even, even with the modules available publicly, uh, that other groups or actors can grab this and do some uh, a real activity similar to what we saw uh, uh, previously in December 2016. Uh, I also want to uh, just uh, quickly point out uh, a lot of us uh, at Dragos are attending conferences and, and various events, uh, and, and we're lucky in that uh, everyone kind of recognizes us and, and, and shakes our hand, and it's really great. Uh, however, I found in a lot of those engagements, they say, we love you, 
uh, but they don't know what we do. Uh, so from a, a Dragos perspective, and what Dragos does is, is really focused on what we call the Dragos ecosystem, which to put very simply is uh, 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 three, three core components. One of those is a software platform uh, that we lovingly call Dragos platform, and it is really focused on industrial uh, asset discovery of what's an environment and how it's laid out, what's talking to what, as well as uh, the proactive uh, threat monitoring and, and some of the uh, analytics and workflow capabilities that, that just uh, aren't out there and tailored to industrial control system networks, as well as the, uh, as well as the worldview intelligence product. Uh, so a crash override is uh, really a, a product of the worldview uh, and, and the team that Joe's on uh, and releasing that out to our customers uh, from a critical event notification perspective, but also uh, regular situational awareness reporting on, on vulnerabilities and threats. That's all part of Worldview. Uh, and then thirdly is a Threat Operations Center. Uh, so that's uh, Dan and I and our team. And we are focused on uh, proactive uh, services and engagements with our customers, as well as doing the, the reactive incident response uh, actions for industrial control systems environments. Uh, and that at a high level is what Dragos does. So next time you hit us up at an event, uh, uh, you can, uh, we can have a more in-depth conversation on that. Uh, but generally you can point any inquiries to info at dragos.com. Uh, and I will just do final note uh, that the Worldview Intelligence product uh, on, uh, responsible for crash override, we do have a 45 day free trial of that. Uh, that expires August 15th. So if you have interest, uh, send a note to info at uh, or if you have follow-up questions on Crash Override or, or any of the uh, activities that we've been involved with over the last week, certainly hit up uh, info at dragos.com, keep the conversation going, uh, and uh, looking forward from hearing from everyone. So, uh, again, thank you for your time, uh, your interest in, in Crash Override. Um, and remember, uh, defense is doable, and uh, we can get in front of this uh, sort of activity. Thank you, everyone. Bye.